Finally, here we, uh, your fellow board members are present. Uh, Mr. Bruce Danielson is at the podium, about ready to uh, uh, present his argument to the board. And then also we have about eight others in the audience for your information.
some of this I'm having to do from memory, but some of it's very clear in my memory. So if you bear with me, I'll, I'll go through from, from there. Uh, in uh, approximately 1981 and uh, 1982, uh, we were in the process of planning a succession plan for the family business. And the succession plan involved uh, having certified audits done of the, of the business and the property. And I interviewed several different firms in the area looking for somebody who could do this job for us. And um, we chose Mr. LaFollette because he professed to have a, a good understanding of what we were supposed to do for computerization of our business. And if you remember, computers in 1980, 83 were big mainframes and the PCs hadn't come along yet. So it took a lot of planning to put a four or five million dollar business into the computer age. And so we were preparing that process. And, and uh, in, the, in the hopes of getting this done properly, uh, one of the things in the certified audit was to make sure uh, that we had all of the, as they say, I's dotted and T's crossed properly and, and that we wouldn't have any uh, additional IRS issues because we were also doing business as, a, as an international export. A heavy part of our business was involved with a, a special export program which required us to do a lot of additional uh, tax forms and requirements to meet the guidelines that were necessary. So after the interviews and all, we, we hired uh, Mr. LaFollette as part of his firm that was down here on Minnesota Avenue, and if I remember the name right, it was LaFollette Jansa Brand, to uh, come in and do the certified audits for us. Uh, the first year, everything seemed to go along well, and the second year, came along and where we had to do two years of audits in order to do some of the financing things that we were planning to do. And, and uh, Mr. LaFollette came to my office and he sat down and, and uh, presented the paperwork that needed to be filled out to make sure that all of this was done. He had even down to the point of having a check drawn. So that uh, because we had to do some things with retained earnings and move things around, that there was a check that needed to be written out. And so he and I went with all his paperwork into my dad's office and proceeded to, to lay it all out. And my father endorsed the check that was to be endorsed. The check was deposited in the bank. And then immediately then my dad wrote a check back to the, to the company. Well, as it turned out, the check should have been written to my mother and she should have endorsed the check. This, this little mistake uh, cost us uh, another IRS audit and we were gonna have a $400,000 tax and penalty assessed to, the, to my parents. And you know, in a small business and we were just coming out of the, the recession of the late 70s, early 80s and we were rebuilding the company all of a sudden, we got hit with a huge penalty that we went back and tried to talk to Mr. LaFollette to see what he could do to help us, and he refused to help us. He refused to take any of the blame for it or help us at all. And in those days, we didn't know anything about errors and emissions insurance that we could have gone after. So we ended up having to hire uh, additional attorneys and tax accountants to help us get out of the problem. And that cost us around $100,000 to just get that taken care of. And uh, Mr. LaFollette uh, refused to have anything to do with us after that, to try and help us get anything taken care of. And we uh, dismissed him, his services from, from being involved with us at that point. And <clears throat> never gave it, you know, we, we had to rebuild. My parents ended up losing. Uh, we lost the ability to uh, rebuild the business the way that we had planned. The succession plan went out the hole because we were fighting a huge loss and the pressure got to be too much and the family just finally sold the business and got out of it. Uh, and that $100,000 that ended up costing to, to pay for all of the legal fees and accounting fees, et cetera, all came out of my parents' retirement. And, you know, that, that's 
even stung to this day. So uh, all we ever wanted was Mr. LaFollette to come up and he refused to have anything to do with us after that point, and to the point where he ran for office a few years ago and we were standing next to each other and he refused to even shake my hand. So I don't know what that was all about at the time, but uh, uh, I just have, uh, I was surprised when, uh, I didn't know who was on this board. In fact, I really don't know much about any of you. Uh, and, and I've kind of left it that way because I haven't felt like that's something that I should ever be concerned about. Uh, I don't know any of you people. The only person that I knew about was when Mr. LaFollette started to talk, and I go, oh my God, that's Greg LaFollette. So I'm sorry if I came in naive. I didn't know, you know that, that I should have actually asked him to recuse himself at that point. He should have been uh, sharp enough uh, being a CPA, knowing that, that conflict of interest situations and bath past business relationships, whether good or bad, are enough to be a recusal. And he didn't do it. And for that, I was, uh, as I wrapped up the meeting and thought about it more, it upset me more and more that, that uh, he never recused himself. He never acknowledged that he even knew me. And I mean, it's 32 years ago, but you don't forget those types of things. I was one of his first bigger clients that he had when he had his accounting firm. And that was disturbing to me. So if you have any questions, I'm... Did it occur to you when you realized who it was that was um, on speakerphone to say something about that? Or? No, I was just, I, I didn't realize, you know, that I've never done this type of thing before. And so I'm just an average citizen. You know, I just came in here, you know, placing a different kind of complaint. And then the more I thought about it, and I, and I remembered the process that he went through over the phone that day of the, you know, the logical, you know, step by step by step that he went through, it was like, yeah, that, that, I remember that. That's kind of how we got into some of the problems we were in. Because it seems so rational and logical. And it, it uh, no, I never gave it a thought that I should have said anything. And I apologize to this board that I, you know, didn't realize that uh, he really should have recused himself. I'm only now just starting to get involved in city politics and understanding some of this stuff. And you guys have a have a lot of work to do up here trying to trying to straighten out some of the things. I knew in the discussions that were being held that day up here that the different members that were sitting here actually were, were trying to find a way to solve the problem that I brought up. And I appreciated that a lot. And so I saw that, that there was some some concentration and some thought going into what I had brought the last time. And yet, the, the thing that bothered me when I got all done was he knew who I was. There's no way he could forget who I was after all those years. I just, uh, you know, to be still a certified public accountant and to have a memory and to have a history, to me that, that just spoke of a problem. And I, and I thought I'd better address it so that it doesn't happen again. And so that's why I brought this to the attention of this board. Any other questions for Mr. Danielson? Well, I don't mean to pursue the wrong avenue here, but you mentioned the succession plan, and your mother did not need to sign a check. It was, well, there was a whole big plan that was out there for our business. And this was a retained earnings check that needed to be moved Somehow, you have to keep a paper trail. And so they were doing a paper trail from, from the company to my parents and then back, and then we were having a, to deal with it in a, in a reinvestment back in the business. And it was just a clean way to do it as I remember it. Well, again, I don't mean to pursue the wrong avenue here, but is it a fact that there was an error made and someone took responsible for it, responsibility for it or is it just something left hanging that never was established? Who's at error? Well, it was it was decided that that Mr. Lafollette made a mistake, 
and that was the way we solved it with the IRS. And that when it went back, the, the attorneys and the accountants that we worked with uh, were able to establish that in the process, and that's how we got out of having to pay the full 400000 that was supposed to go just to the, to the uh, IRS. And whereas it ended up costing us hiring attorneys and accountants, and uh, you know, essentially we had to pay 25% of what the, of what the uh, liability was gonna be. Well, I realize that, I realize it's complicated, and for the third time I'm repeating, this oh. is not what the issue is. But it seems to me if there was an error made, Maybe it was an error of omission of information that was given to him. We don't know. So, I mean, we're really, as far as I'm concerned, I'm on cloud nine. I don't know who made an error well, and, and, and so on. And we could go on and on, and that's a whole different and, case. And I'm not trying that situation. Yeah. I, I, you know, that, all, that is... Neither am I, but you are basing, you are basing and recusing yourself on an error. Yeah. And I don't, you know, how, how am I to know are we to know the error? Where is the error? Well, and, and, and then there's going to be two sides to this. So we're talking about something that is really not appropriate to what. Uh, well, to and, and, and what I'm saying, and the reason I'm bringing this forward, is that Mr. LaFollette should have at least informed this board that, that we did have a prior business arrangement. I realize that. And, 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 and you, but that goes two ways. You should have seen it too. As well as he, I mean, you, well, I you can go back and forth with that all day. I'm not, I'm not on this board. I'm not an ethics expert on this board and on the city's ethics rules. This board is the city attorney is, and and so so they should have, you know, Mr. LaFollette should have said at the beginning of this, having seen my name, that. I had a business relationship with this individual several years ago and should have sought I, I, advice from this board. I grant you that, but I'm just saying, you understand, at least my position, I can't speak for the entire board, but I really don't, I really don't know how I can base a judgment if I don't hear the other side, well, if I don't see in writing what has happened and so on. So I think we're just, at least I'm just grasping for straws here on who's at fault and why he should refuse himself. So I, I guess, you know, well, we're, as far as I'm concerned, we're after something, we're chasing something that really doesn't matter for this case uh, until I get all the facts or know what's... I'm sure that Mr. LaFollette will probably have something to say in all of this, and, and I'll be glad to come back up and, and address anything that he brings up. Uh, it's 32 years ago, statute of limitations is long gone. We had a fire, destroyed a lot of the paperwork that was involved with this, and you know, I, I searched for everything that I could find, and you know, they just, the, uh, there were the problems. But, but the fact is, and Mr. LaFollette may even have the business records from that time period to say, to say that we have, you know, what dates all of this took place. I don't know. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Mr. Sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, th this is uh, for the, the city attorney. Um, I don't know whether we need to do this in executive session or just can do it publicly. Um, I need to know specifically how the rules of recusal uh, are defined in the ordinance. What, what exactly does it say and, and what exactly uh, are the requirements? Sure. I, if I may, Carol, I'd be happy to. I mean, the, the section reference of the ordinance is 35.025 uh, includes also board members in terms of any conflicts of interest. Uh, by chapter 35, a conflict of interest is a financial interest, a pecuniary interest that creates a conflict for a person. In my estimation, uh, this does not state a complaint, even assuming the allegations of Mr. Daniels, and it doesn't issue a ethics violation in terms of Chapter 35. As administrative officials, you are doing a quasi-judicial role. I would say that if we want to follow the common law of South Dakota, there are other issues that may 
generate the need to recuse yourself, either there's an actual bias, and that is a strong presumption in South Dakota law, uh, that an administrative official is presumed to be objective and capable of judging controversies fairly on the basis of their own circumstances. That strong presumption can be overcome only when the record establishes actual bias or the existence of circumstances that lead to the conclusion that an unacceptable risk of actual bias or prejudgment adhered in the proceeding. Uh, the seminal case in South Dakota involves an uh, administrative law judge who was seeking employment with John Morell and company, and she actually took him and accepted a position with John Morell four days after she rendered a decision where John Morell was one of the parties, our state Supreme Court frowned upon that for, for obvious reasons. Um, I guess if you haven't heard all the all the rest of the, the story yet, certainly from Greg, but that's generally the other part of the equation, and I think that is a very cautious approach to put you folks in the same camp as state administrative law judge. But you know, to be safe, I would probably put you in that camp because you are performing a quasi-judicial function. Yeah, uh, Jeff, do you agree with me? <laughs> uh, well, no, I. I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks for the background. I, I do have a couple of questions, but I don't want to interrupt. So I'm done. Okay. Go ahead, John. Uh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, just, just to make sure I heard Mr. Danielson, and this is Jim Janowski. Uh, during the hearing, and, and when Greg was on the phone during that meeting, you recognized his voice. Uh, I think you said you're doing this. You didn't think to bring it up at the time. Did I hear that right? Yes. And as you thought about it afterwards, you thought to file the complaint. Um, is it possible that, that Mr. LaFala didn't recognize you since he wasn't there? Well, if he, I, I can only assume, because I don't know how the whole board works, I can only assume that, that uh, he would have had the paperwork there, and he could have asked the simple question, is this the Bruce Danielson from Alcester? I mean, that would, there, there aren't a lot of Bruce Danielsons around, so. Uh, who were fair, fair past enough. clients. Okay, okay. Fair, fair enough. I mean, there are a number of Bruce Danielsons, and, and it, it, it is possible, it sounds like, to a degree, it's possible he didn't know you were the same. I, I can't make that, uh, I can't make that judgment. I didn't uh, have his paperwork ahead of time, and I can only assume he had my paperwork ahead of time, so he could have asked. Fair enough. Let, let me ask you just a couple other questions. Um, I think as Dave pointed out, there, there needs to be some evidence of bias. And, I, and, and remembering back to the earlier hearing, I, I remember uh, Greg asking you to help us understand what the complaint was and giving you opportunity to flesh out the details of your complaint. Do, do you remember that? I remember, yeah, some parts of it, yes. Okay. And, and so is there anything at all that you believe would point to the fact that Craig didn't listen to what you had to say or at least um, you know, consider the testimony and the evidence that you submitted? I felt like he was uh, putting me down for even questioning the ethics and the process after I had already admitted that I didn't know the whole process and that, uh, and that I had published the, uh, given the press release out at the time, and I understood at that point that, that I had actually made some mistakes even before I, I had uh, come here that day. So, and I admitted that right up front when we started this process, and it wouldn't have taken Mr. LaFalle very long to understand, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, what was, what was happening. So, uh, I didn't feel that Mr. LaFalle had actually gave me much of a fair hearing based on his previous prejudice. All right, and, and, and again, I'm just asking, other than your claim that you felt that he was putting you down, and it was something that you did, unfortunately, you, you made public a private to confidential complaint. He did ask you, though, to help us understand what your issue was. And I, I mean, again, I'm asking, is there anything at all that you believe he just simply ignored your testimony or made a decision that was completely without consideration of the testimony? 
Uh, to tell you the truth, right now, I, I, I can't answer that. I, uh, estimation of my memory far exceeds actuality. Um, I'm not particularly clear on things that happened 35 years ago. Um, I was practicing public accounting 35 years ago. Um, we had purchased a local office of a regional firm, um, probably a dozen employees and maybe a million dollars worth of billings uh, at the time. Um, I do not, I did not at, at the time that this was filed or even when I saw the second filing, I did not know the name Bruce Daniels. I knew, I recognized, once I saw it, I recognized a Danielson. My client was a corporation and the stockholder was a man by the name of Glenn Danielson. Um, I'm sorry that I don't know all of his family. I can tell you that my, my recollection of our relationship with that corporation is that we did some work for a few years and then we didn't. I don't recall why the, the relationship ended, business relationship started at all time. I certainly have absolutely no recollection of the kind of case that Mr. Danielson explained. Um, if those facts were even remotely true, there would have been, I assume, a lawsuit or an ethics violation or something. And believe me, I practiced, I practiced public accounting for 24 years. It's been 15 years since I practiced. There was never an ethics violation. There was never a suit. There was never an out-of-court settlement or anything like that. Um, a couple of times, maybe a penalty, which is a normal operation of a, of a CPA firm, uh, a penalty payment or something, but not, not of any particular consequence. So um, I have no memory, no recollection of, of, those, uh, of those facts at all. I can't quite understand the, the transactions that Mr. Daniels have explained, but, but it doesn't matter. Um, so, and as far as recognizing um, his name, uh, I don't recognize him by looking at him, so I would have said if I had been in the room and I had seen him, it would not have changed anything because I didn't recognize him, I didn't recognize his name. Had I recognized his name, it would have made no difference. I don't recall that we had a bad business relationship. Finally, uh, assuming that I somehow remembered that there was a bad business relationship, I still would not have, that still would not have impacted my handling of this, of that particular case. It was 35 years ago. And although I wish I had that kind of memory, I simply did. So that's all I have to say. I'll answer questions. So you're, you're saying that you don't associate Mr. Danielson with bad feelings or that you have anything? Cer certainly not. I, you know, had I known who he was, I, you know, and if he'd come up and said, hey, my, it's his father, my father used to run Alcona, I'd have said, oh, hi, because I don't, I don't recall having any, having any bad, business relationship. No. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Mr. Lopez? How many clients do you have? Uh, I 
complaints have you had Greg, over the years as a CPA? I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether I should say thousands or tens of thousands, but certainly many, many, many thousands. And um, Alcoda was a high school business, but was certainly not material to our practice then or now.
those churches over the 20 years that I was a pastor probably had a total of maybe 2,500 members uh, between all four of the churches. Um, honestly, the way my head works, once I left a church, if I ran into one of those people on the street, I wouldn't remember the name. Uh, I, I have an auto-delete uh, <laughs> in, in, in my head. And so it doesn't sound odd to me at all that he doesn't remember uh, that just That's just the way different people's heads work. Um, You know, it, it seems to me that the only the only basis on which we can possibly rule on this complaint uh, is our understanding of the ordinance and whether there is a whether there is an actual violation of the ordinance uh, or of the presumptions of South Dakota law. I, 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 I you know, I, I hear how how personal this is for you, and I'm really very sorry about that. Uh, I, I kind of think if you had brought it up at the original meeting, uh, that Chairman Lafayette would have would have responded appropriately to that. Um, but I can't hold him responsible for not remembering that. Well, and, and I, I can I, I can appreciate that to some extent because I've had I've had I've had a few thousand employees through the years in the different companies that I've been involved in, and and so you know I don't remember every one of them. You know, there are probably some of them who don't like you very much. And well, I'm sure there are. Well, um, and if I was if I was on an ethics board, and and uh, and they came in and made some statement, and I didn't remember them, okay. Uh, but most of these people went about their daily work, and there was never any problems, and you just went on with life because. You know, they did their job, I did my job, I paid them, and, and everything was fine. And, you know, years go by and somebody walks up to you and says, you know, they remembered me from somewhere, and I go, oh, where was that? And, you, and oh, okay, you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember you, and that's another story. But there are people that, that actually we had disputes with or problems with, and those people you seem to remember, and from both sides. And and so I'm I'm just saying that uh, this was this was one of Mr. LaFollette's first uh, snafus that in, in his new practice and and we tried to work with him to get him to help us and and there was a refusal and then you know so let it all go by and it was gone and you know life moved on and and uh, we we didn't know about things like like uh, errors and emissions insurance. I mean, that, we weren't in that business. We didn't understand that, that we could have actually asked his errors and emissions insurance to take care of it. You know, uh, it wasn't until after we were all done with everything and somebody said it one day and we, we had no clue. I understand. So, so you know, it, it's clear that you have a, a very strong emotional reaction and I understand that too. Um, it's equally clear that Mr. LaFollette doesn't have the same emotional reaction and you know for me I, I don't see how he can be biased against you. Well there, there are things that can happen, I'm sorry, that, that, it, human nature says you know that uh, you compartmentalize some things and, and you kind of set them aside. And this was one of those things that, that probably got compartmentalized in him, like it did with, you know, with uh, with me until I sat here and realized that he was here. And then it was like, you know, uh, I'm sorry. It was, you know, I I never even gave it a thought that I should have I should have stopped the proceeding that day. I just so, never even gave it a thought. I only understand that, and it did come flooding back to you. It did not come flooding back to him, from what I can tell. And you know, I don't. We're not about, you know, saying who's 
I mean, we're not about saying that people are being honest or dishonest when there, you know, is something like this that happens. We believe that you're being honest. I believe that Mr. Rufala is being honest. All of us have had that same experience, as you just admitted you have too. I've been a, a professional counselor for 30 years, and I still have people that come up and, and talk to me, and I, it's really dicey when you were their professional counselor, and it, but you know, there's been so many people that um, it, it's hard. I mean, we, we don't remember everything. But in an, in an ethics board, and that's why I'm bringing this up, uh, it's, and there's going to be uh, more of these types of issues coming up. I mean, there, uh, and I'm trying to go through the ethics rules, the code, and I'm trying to understand uh, for somebody like me to come before a body like this and make any kind of a request, uh, uh, any kind of a charge, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing for us to do because this is not what we do for a living. And we just want to be able to go into a rule book that actually spells out what it means to be part of this group. We want to be able to come here and say, uh, I have a question and get an answer that actually fits. But every time we bring up a question, be it here or one of the other city offices, there's always some rule that's buried and it's written this way or it's interpreted this way. And, and uh, so we come to the ethics board uh, with the understanding that, that uh, you're, you're fair-minded, you're fair judgment, and we want to be able to, you know, not hurt anybody in this process, but we want to make it work for us. You know, the job of, of the city attorney is actually to protect the charter of the city of Sioux Falls. It isn't to protect the mayor, it isn't to protect you board members, it isn't, his, his job isn't to protect anything other than the charter and to make sure the charter doesn't get hurt by the people that are sitting in these offices. And just as the, the attorney general of South Dakota, his job is to maintain the, the integrity of the state constitution. He isn't the governor's attorney. He isn't uh, the secretary of state's attorney. He is the attorney for the Constitution and whatever it takes to protect the laws in the state of South Dakota. Attorney General of the, of the United States is the same as the, the attorney in charge of the Constitution. And that's what we expect you know, to happen. So we come to this board and we don't want to have to find some secret rule book that's buried in a basement somewhere that keeps us from having to air our grievances properly. And it's, it's really becoming disconcerting to a lot of people in town. And so all we're doing is I'm bringing this forward. Uh, I had, a, I had a, a bad business relationship with an individual. Uh, I, I wish to have this person recuse himself every time I show up in this chamber because I don't trust that he will be fair and honest, especially after what I've just been through today. And, and I'm expressing my concern about it. Because I'm sorry he doesn't have a memory of sitting in my office and me sitting in his office for days on end. Uh, that's something that's kind of hard to forget. And I mean, 32 years of sitting in an office, hashing out all kinds of detail, going out and counting machine screws and teaching him how to do physical inventories in, in our facility. And him having to be there as we are counting to make sure that things are done properly. I was with him the entire time he was in that building. And I spent hours with him at his office here in Sioux Falls. And I'm sorry he's, he's forgotten that we had this tax issue that he was at fault for. I'm trying not to make that the main situation here, but there are things that even subliminally, and you as a counselor and you as a, a pastor, there's, there are things that happen in a person's psyche subliminally. And you may not remember why that struck a bell 
but eventually it comes to you why that seems familiar. And I, that could have happened that day up there. I've worked a, with a lot of people over the years in business consulting, and, and we ask a lot of questions and go through a lot of things when we sit down with our with the client and try and get it taken care of. And and I, I feel like I'm a counselor many times. You know, and sometimes you almost feel like a pastor, you know. It's I mean because you're you're trying to get people to work together and, and to make things happen. And so I understand where you're coming from on that. Well I would hate to think that you might be considering us unethical because we did not agree oh, that, that, that your complaint was. No, no, I I have, I'm sorry I, I interrupted you, but no, I'm not calling this board unethical. No, I'm not. I, there's no intimation of that. I have a concern about somebody's uh, one individual not recusing himself uh, from a bad, past business relationship. And, and that's all it is. I don't know any of you people. You know, Dave I've met at the gym and you know, different things, but the rest of the members of this board, I've never met any of you people before. And so I'm, you know, I, I now know more about you two than I knew before. I have nothing, no, of nothing about uh, Mr. Swanhorse, Mr. Swanhorse, or the gentleman on the phone. I, I don't, uh, so I'm, you people, uh, I saw the three of you sitting here last time. And I saw your concern in trying to do the right thing. And I appreciated that a lot. And in the concern I brought up at that time, but I also realized at that time I had done wrong because I had been informed that I had done it wrong. And so I knew the answer you were going to give because that was the only right answer that could have been given at that time. So I didn't have a problem at that point. It was only after I realized this other situation should have been handled a lot differently. And I'm sorry I've taken a lot of your time today on this. and, and uh, but I, I do have a, a strong concern, especially now going forward, uh, with any of the concerns that I'm going to be bringing at this meeting and some future meetings, if that works out, uh, that, uh, that Mr. LaFalle recuse himself when I'm, when I'm appearing before the board, or however you're going to deal with it. So I thank you very much for your time. Did you have any other questions? I'm sorry. Talk about a couple follow up comments. Okay. Um, we've now spent the last 45 minutes here with what I feel is my character being a sale, and I take high offense. I would ask the members of the board to consider background and reputation. Um, I have been, I practiced public accounting for 25 years, I'm now an executive of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Chair of the Ethics Committee for the State Society of CPAs for 17 years to be accused publicly of an ethics violation is incredibly hurtful. To listen to a litany of malpractice that is absolutely untrue with absolutely no proof. And I have to sit and listen to someone, whoever they happen to be, accuse me of those kinds of malpractice. And I don't know what the rules are for slander and libel, and I'm not frankly interested. Um, this, this comes very close. So I would ask members of the board to consider background, reputation, and intent when you look at a finding in this report. <coughs> Well, Carol, this, this, this is Jeff, if yes. I may start. Please. I, I echo the comments made by the board. I, I certainly understand the concerns. Uh, they don't seem fabricated. They, you know, and, I, and I see both sides. And I also hear Greg and, and the, the comments he just made. So I turn back to the rules of Dave. 
We have a motion to report the findings based on your discussion and have allow Carol to sign on behalf of the vice chair. Falls, we can consider the uh, 
the events of the State of the City Address to not be a political event baffle me. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the mayor and the city is specifically prohibited from using Carnegie or any other, other city resources to give a campaign event on the city's time and dime. Now, had he had a, an event at Carnegie and paid the rent on the hall or done something, that's, that's one issue. What we ran into on the night of the, of the, uh, or the day of the State of the City address was the mayor using the event to give his campaign speech. I've sat through his campaign speech enough to know that that, that, that speech was just purely his campaign speech. Uh, I, I could have brought a whole series of recordings, and if I need to, I will bring them and have you all sit through all of these different recordings of all these different uh, campaign events. Had we learned something, had we gone through and actually uh, not had the city creating the, the uh, uh, PowerPoint demonstrations, uh, the mayor having a sign made that he could wave around based on information that wasn't even factual, it was a popularity poll done somewhere, and we don't and was never given any credence to any of this. But the city went and spent I don't know twenty five thirty dollars or something to have that sign made, and so he could wave it around and get a publicity picture to go in the art city or on the TV cameras. I don't know, but had he given us anything close to what Mayor Munson used to give as a state of the city address? It would have been acceptable. But all he did was give us the campaign speech. And that was the basis for this, for this complaint. Um, another side of the, uh, the complaint was uh, it was stated that he was to give the, uh, the state of the city address at a certain time period after the, uh, the financial statements were, were issued in March. And I have, uh, what I've done is I've gone out and I've gone out to Siri, as far back as Siri could go, that's the city's uh, broadcast system and record keeping system. And I was able to put together The, uh, <clears throat> the dates of the uh, comprehensive annual fi financial report for each one of the years that were being used as examples. And so if you, if you notice there, uh, on each of the dates uh, of when they were issued by the city. And in fact, make it a little bit easier to follow along with what I'm going to do. I'm going to hand you these two sheets that are actually spreadsheets that are attached on the back of, of that format. And so during the, the process that we went through last time, uh, it was stated that, uh, this, that the mayor had to give his state of the city within, a, within two weeks of the of the uh, issuance of the financial statement. If you go down through this process, you'll see where the issuance of the financial report, I'm looking at the big sheet on the spreadsheet, the issuance of the financial report is uh, right in 2007. Mayor Munson did it on the same, same day. They issued them together. Uh, then we go down into, uh, you'll see this is, this is off series, so you'll see some special council meetings. And then you give the budget and address in July, and, and then we come back in uh, issuance of financial report in 2008 was on March 20th. The special, then we have Mayor Munson giving his presentation on the 27th. But we go down through here, and you'll even see in 2009, and uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I, we had elections involved. 
during this whole time period, and there was trying to say that there was some kind of correlation between you know, Mayor Munson did this versus Mayor Huther. So I went through and analyzed the, the time sequence. And the issuance of the financial statement, I can't find it in the charter when that's required. I would assume it must have been by the end of March because that would be the first quarter. Uh, so, and it was always done in March. Then we get down to Mayor Huther when he's going into giving his first state of the city address. It actually shows he did it in uh, 2011. He did it on the 13th of April. Uh, he gave, uh, uh, then further down, it goes into all of these dates far after. It, it, we even have it in May 3rd of 2012. So his answer to why he had to have give his campaign speech as the state of the city address was in a, another way to use the city's diamond time in order to run for re-election. And we can go down through this and in more detail if you'd like, but you can see it right on here that, that he was <clears throat> moving things around so that he could campaign using Carnegie Hall. And that is a direct violation of, of what the, uh, the charter has stated. And it, when he, there was some comments here the last time, and I don't see those PowerPoint examples here showing that the, that the mayor's office had all these PowerPoints done. And then they said, well, Mayor Munson had a whole bunch of PowerPoints. Uh, he had a bunch of slides he put up. I mean, they weren't PowerPoints, anything like what the mayor had. And then this is, this is something I never saw in any of Mayor Munson's or in any of Mayor Huther's prior uh, State of the City addresses. And that's campaigning. I mean, that's, he used these examples in his speeches, and he had somebody in, the, in City Hall be able to make that for him so that he could do it and show it on Carnegie, uh, on the, at Carnegie on the TV, in front of a room full of city employees who probably had other things they probably should have been doing than sitting and listening to a campaign speech again. So I'll take any questions you have. Any members of the board have any questions? Well, I think we established that the charter does not give a specific date. It does require the mayor to do a state of the city address, but it doesn't give any date. Um, I think that your concerns need to be addressed to the committee that deals with uh, changes in the charter. Well, that's going to be addressed. I mean, we're going to be making I mean, some if, changes, but... If, if they believe that a date should be set for when the mayor should give the state of the city address, they need to change the charter. Um, that isn't, that isn't within our purview. And, um, I understand, I, I understand that you that you didn't like the state of the city address and that you didn't feel it was genuine state of the city address. Uh, there would be many people that would agree with you and many more that would disagree with you. Um, I don't see the app. That's, I just don't. Well, if you don't, if you don't mind my saying, ethics, ethics has a lot to do with appearance also. And if for three years, three prior years, he found time to do it mid-April to May, and the financial reports were always done on a certain schedule, and they've been on the same routine up until this year. And it was election time, and we need some good press. And that's the appearance. If you, a lot of politics and a lot of what happens is appearance. And this was once again uh, shutting rules around to give an appearance of something. And 
what we're trying to do is establish through this process, and we'll be working with trying to get some things done with the charter. And if we have to do more petition drives to drive people crazy with petitions to get some things done, then, then we're going to have to try and figure out ways to get rid of some of these ambigu ambiguities and abuses that happen to the system. And this one is, is a basic abuse. Both of these A and B that, that are being brought up right now are abuses to the system by, and it could be Mayor Huther today, it could be you know, Mayor Smith tomorrow, we don't know. And unless we establish some kind of guidelines and rules and, and try to hold people accountable to these types of decisions, you know, the, the appearance of impropriety is often as bad as the actual impropriety. So that's what I'm asking, and I just wanted to open this back up to, to consideration. I, this time I tried to follow all the rules that, that were laid out ahead of time. I made mistakes last time, and I don't feel that it actually got a fair, honest discussion last time because, because I had made that mistake last time, and this time I wanted to make sure that, that the whole process was openly discussed. Mr. Danielson, I, as I, I think I said in the last meeting, um, I, I, I really do appreciate your concern, and I can agree that it doesn't look great. There is, there is nothing in the rule. If, I mean, if we had had a, a basis of any kind in the rules uh, to rule in your favor last time, we would have done so, uh, regardless of the mistakes you made in making the application. Um, we didn't, and we still don't. It, it's just not there. You're, you're defining the mayor's speech as a campaign. That's not defined anywhere in law or fact. The mayor is required to give a state of the city report, and that's what, that's what it was billed as, that, that's what he said he was doing. Attributing motive to him is something that we cannot do. Um, I, I'm sorry, it, it, I, there's it, not a basis in the rules as they exist for us to find your complaint valid. If you get the rules changed, we'll enforce the rules. That I mean, that's what we're here for. We're volunteer citizens <coughs> who are here to enforce the rules. If there's a rule for us to enforce, we'll enforce it. There is a I, I, you know, I don't know how much how much more direct to be. I, I, I don't, I don't have basis to find in the rules as they exist to find in your favor. Well, in actuality, what you're what you're saying in these you know rulings this afternoon is you're accentuating why we need to correct the rule book, and 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 if if you're not able to find a problem with this when most of the citizens of Sioux Falls see a problem with it, then we need to, we need to find a way to fix the system. If most of the citizens of Sioux Falls have a problem with it, they know how to make a change. Well, and that's, that's essentially what we're trying to establish as part of this, is, and appreciate your time and being able to help us define you know, that, that, that there's an additional set of rules out there that we need to either add or find. And, and uh, that's what we're going to have to be trying to do then. So I appreciate your, your time. And you know, it would have, it would have been uh, uh, much easier to deal with this if the mayor would have been here. And I know he's busy, but this is an important issue. And it isn't just for this mayor, it's for all of the mayors and city council people to come that these issues may spring upon us. And 
It's, it's the responsibility of that office holder to be here when a citizen has this type of complaint to bring. And I don't know how to compel the mayor to be here to answer these questions. Fife, the city attorney. Um, I would first request that the board take judicial notice of their prior findings and conclusions from the prior complaint. And uh, certainly, I think your questions are already echoing those. I would like to uh, present some testimony from Heather Hitterdahl, who is the communication specialist for the city. And she will go through uh, and compare the 2013 State of the City Address and also compare it to the 2014 State of the City Address. And then I would like to reserve a few minutes to discuss uh, at least some of the many allegations that have been repeated by Mr. Jennings. So thank you. I'd like to introduce Heather Hitterdahl. Sorry, Heather, before. Uh, we have the PowerPoints for 2013 and 14, and Carrie has them in her hands. We'll pass them out to the board and also to anyone in the audience, so everyone will have and look at the same thing. I apologize, Heather, didn't mean to interrupt. Between the finance department and myself, we do come up with a lot of the content for the State of the City Address, and I propose that to the mayor for his review. So I would like to go through the slides for 2014 and compare it to 2013. And I'm doing that because that is how we come up with the content of the time for this speech in particular. We start with last year's speech and modify it to update it for the current year. Slide one, of course, is very similar to um, slide one from 2013. You have a, a similar design. I didn't know that until afterwards, but it does even look similar to the last year's presentation. Slide two is very similar to slide two from 2013. This is just a slide that sets the tone for the presentation, and that line was uh, part of the letter that the mayor sent to the council on uh, no, uh, March 7th to announce that he wasn't going to give the state of the city address. Slide three is very similar to slide four from 2013. You'll notice that in a lot of these uh, slides, we weren't terribly creative even in changing the headlines. A lot of the headlines are similar as well from 2013. Slide four is updated numbers from slide six from last year. Uh, in 2013, a lot of the graphs went from 2003 to 2012, and of course in 2014, now the years go from 2004 to 2013, but many of these graphs are simply updated numbers from the year before. And finance does provide much of these information for these graphs. Slide 5 is updated numbers from slide 7 in 2013. Slide six is updated numbers from slide eight in 2013. Slide seven is updated numbers from slide nine in 2013. Slide eight is updated numbers from slide 10 in 2013. Slide nine is updated numbers from slide 11 in 2013. And slide 10 is updated numbers from slide 13 in 2013. Slide 11, uh, this is an unusual one. It is in response to slide 45 in 2013. Uh, in 2013, the first pass of the neighborhood branch pickup had just been completed after the ice storm. The state of the city address took place about two weeks after the ice storm last year, and uh, this slide is in response to the mention of that last year. These numbers have been presented many times in previous presentations. 
Uh, slide 12 was not in the presentation from 2013, but it was presented by the finance department to the council on March 11th when uh, Tracy Sherback gave his year and financial report. And a slide similar to this was in the 2011 State of the City Address, although not in the 2013 address. Slide 13 was not in the 2013 uh, State of the City Address, but it was presented orally to the council, Tracy Trebek, uh, presented to the fiscal committee meeting on November 5th of last year, and a lot of this information was presented at that time. It was just placed <coughs> Slide 14 was not in the 2013 State of the City address, but it was in the 2011 State of the City address. We did address uh, debt, particularly in this presentation, because it was a topic in the media at the time the speech was given. Slide 15 is updated numbers from slide 16 in the 2013 State of the City address. HR provides this information each year. Slide 16 is very similar to slide 15 from 2013, talking about the pension reform in <coughs> 2013. Slide 17 is very similar to slide 17 from 2013, talking about the booming economy. Slide 18 is very similar to slide 19 from 2013, community development and funding building services provide much of this information each year. And the final bullet about the top building projects for 2014 is public record. It's just based on the top projects of building permit valuation. Slide 19 is updated numbers from slide 21 in 2013. Slide 20 is updated numbers from slide 20 last year. Slide 21 is updated and very similar to slide 22 from last year. Community development and bound funds results provide a lot of that information. Slide 22 is again similar to slide 24 in 2013. Slide 23 is similar to slide 25 in 2013. Slide 24 is a slide I would consider new to this presentation. It is in the spirit of the other slides about uh, street construction that are in every state of the city address, but these two projects were completed in 2013, so those are new projects. Slide 25 is in response to slide 36 from the presentation in 2013. I talked about uh, the citizen survey that was completed in 2013 and how citizens believe in the and improving the parks. The Parks and Recreation Department provided the information for that slide. Slide 26 is uh, very similar to slides 27, 28, and 29. And uh, so is slide 27. Those are street projects. The first slide is city funded projects. Second slide is city and department of transportation funded projects. Now to slide 28, which is very similar to slide 30 from 2013. Slide 29 is in response to slide 37 from 2013. It talks about the need to do more in the area of affordable housing as this year we did. Uh, respond to that and <coughs> what we had done in the past year. Community development provided that information. Slide 30 is very similar to slide 31, talking about confidence. A lot of the sections of information and presentation are similar to last year. Slide 31 is in response to slide 37 from 2013. We talked about the need to do more regarding traffic flow and public works did provide this information and a website about the East 26th Street project has been live since January. Slide 32 is also in response to slides 36 and 37 from last year's presentation. Slide 37 last year talked about the 
increasing public safety. Slide 36 talked about code enforcement and public transportation was mentioned by the mayor as an area of challenge for the city moving forward into the future. Slide 33 is updated information from slide 40. We each year have a list of the street construction projects for the coming year. The Public Works Engineering Division provides that information and we did have a new conference with this information back in November. The rail yard redevelopment slide, slide 34, is updated information from slide 41 last year, and Public Works provides this information. Slide 35 is very similar to slide 18 from last year, with a, a recent headline talking about the economy and some problems. Slide 36 is again a, a recent headline similar to slide 18. Last year, last year's presentation also talked about some survey results and how people feel about living in Sioux Falls, so I consider it similar to that information last year. Slide 37 is similar to slide 46 from last year, just recapping the tone on the address. <coughs> and slide 38 is the same slide we end up with every year. It's updated dates on when the broadcast will be reoccurring on the ceiling. Do you have any questions for me based on the content of the State of the City address? Heather, can you tell me when the approximately, when the last piece of factual information, the geometric information, was, that you got the last number that went into this book? Probably the day of the speech. We're always making changes the day, even the day of the speech. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, and I, I appreciate Heather's assistance in pointing out to you how almost identical 2013 to 2014 is with the state of the city address. Flippant part of me would say, I hate to let facts get in the way of a good argument, but I think these facts are very conclusive. It is a very similar speech. You heard last time from Brett Matheson uh, that certainly the state of the city addresses have been very typical for many years now. You can see graphically and content-wise, 2013 and 2014 are almost identical. The data just changes from year to year. It's a very similar speech. You look up what a State of the Union address is on Wikipedia, and it says very clearly, a State of the Union address is to be upbeat and inspirational, to motivate the troops, shall we say, into action for the next year. That's exactly what this speech has been every year that we're aware of in the city of Sioux Falls. There's a good reason there were several city employees there that day. They were being congratulated for the great job they have been doing, and also being motivated by the mayor, who is the chief executive officer of our city, to go out and keep up the good work, and here are some additional projects that we want to get done. The mayor isn't here because you folks have already found this same set of facts to be a frivolous complaint without any basis in law or fact. The mayor has so many things on his schedule on a daily basis, he cannot meet every request for his appearance. Why would he spend two hours here on a complaint that you folks have already found is frivolous? In the end, I would urge you to find this frivolous yet again. I don't think there's anything here that's changed. All we've heard is some more argument that has been blasted out of the water by the facts. And in terms of what's motivating this, you need to keep a couple things in mind. Mr. Danielson has come to the city council and stated at general public input that the purpose in his life now is to critique city government. And he thanked the city council for giving him a purpose in life. These complaints will not cease. After we found the first one frivolous and without any basis in law and fact, what happens? We get three more. Then we listen 
as unfortunately Greg had to listen to over almost an hour of character assassination from someone who says, well, I can't produce any documents because the dog ate my homework. At some point, I would urge you to not only dismiss this, but to dismiss it with prejudice because these complaints will keep coming. It's the same set of facts. It's the same incident, the state of the city address. We've already gone through this. You've given us a fair hearing. You've heard more facts today, at least from our side, in terms of here's the content-based issue. There's nothing there. Your bylaws also state that you can make a finding that a complaint is brought for harassment purposes. I would urge you to make that finding as well today. For this type of character assassination, these types of frivolous complaints will simply continue. People have free speech. Yes, they do. But at some point, you have a lot of innocent people that are affected by that exercise of free speech. And we have boards such as yourselves that are all volunteer citizens trying to do a great job for the city of Sioux Falls, being impacted, being impugned in your character, simply out of, shall we say, spite for city government. Mr. Danielson has the only a uh, petition outstanding at the moment. He has a ballot question committee, Citizens for Integrity. I submit to you, there's gonna be a lot of these types of activities by Mr. Danielson to generate publicity for his cause, to try and generate signatures on that petition. That's all this is about. Again, I urge you to find yet again the frivolous and brought for harassment purposes. Thank you. Members of the board have comments or questions. Uh, Mr. Davis, I'm going to give you three more minutes. All right. Because I, uh, I, I found it very interesting. And, and I understand uh, through all the years I've been involved in, in political activity of different sorts, uh, some of what was just uh, said was to impugn my integrity. Uh, and, I, and I'm sorry the dog ate my homework. Uh, my question before this body, if the mayor couldn't be here at this time, why wasn't he here last time? Uh, that's, that's just plain and simple. If I brought something up last time and it was all done through surveys, why is the city attorney representing the mayor? Uh, he's off the, the dais, he's now back here in, in the group and all of a sudden now he is representing the mayor. Who does he work for? The charter or the mayor? Uh, he's making assumptions for what my petition drive is. That has nothing and no bearing in this, and it never was the cause for which I'm, I have that petition drive out there. I'm trying, as this board was just asking questions about a few minutes ago, about trying to find a way to, to fix the system so that people are actually accountable and, and, the, and the laws and the code actually fit what the citizens actually ask for. Um, I never went to the city council saying my purpose in life has been found by going to the, to the city council and talking. It's, it's allowed me to now express some things when I've been to the city and I will go to the city and I'm assuming now and I can see the stain when I'm, when I'm with some of the council members and the city attorney, when I do appear before the council and try and talk to them, like I'm trying to ask you people questions today and trying to get answers. And we don't have a vehicle anymore in this city for being able to address the city council as it was done under Mayor Munson's days and earlier. And so all we're asking is to have some way to be able to redress our grievances with the city, and that's a total different part of what's going on today. I brought two issues today on this particular matter. You can vote on them together, however you're gonna do it. Uh, but the city's dime and time was spent writing campaign language in this document. If you wanna go into you know, how to write campaign literature, I can show you what's being done on number 30. On, on uh, number two, I can go back through each one of these and tell you why these types of words are inflammatory in a political sense. They are not the same words being used here. They're the same words he was using in his campaign speeches and the way he was describing things. We don't have the transcript here, but if you were to take 
the actual videos of his campaign appearances, the audios of those campaign experiences, and what was happening at the State of the City Address, you could overlay them over the top of each other. And that's where we have a problem. There's, there's inflammatory things that have been said. Mr. Uh, Fifely has brought some topics up that weren't any part of this discussion, all only brought up to inflame. And, and I have a serious problem when the city attorney is representing the mayor and not representing the charter. Thank you. Comments by members of the board. Jeff, do you have anything? I actually do. Thanks, thanks Ray. Um, you know, again, listening to <coughs> the testimony of everyone today, uh, I, I just want to steer the board back to, I think, the standard that we need to apply. And, and just go back to the section for the ordinance side of itself. It just says that, that the city can't pay for it. Jeff, I'm going to ask you, as uh, our legal counsel, as a member of the bar, if you could tell us whether or not we are 
uh, a better legal ground to deal with these separately, uh, or whether or not we should combine them. I don't know if one is more work or less work, or what we should do. Do you have advice? Um, you know, I, I, I maybe, I don't know that there's, there's a specific distinction. I think that certainly as a board, we vote to combine those who we felt that they were necessarily linked. It may, may, may make more sense, Greg, for us to deal with them separately and resolve them individually. Um, but I do think there's certainly latitude. It might make for a cleaner record if we were to resolve them separately. That's it. It makes sense. We'll, I'll accept the so motion dealing with 14 we're, we're I thought this was being um, I'm sorry. It is. It's 14 p.m. Okay. Um, favor signifies aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We will move on to complaint 14C. Um, and Mr. Danielson, I would ask you if uh, if you have new information, things that we have not already talked about that, that are specific to this, um, we've spent 100 minutes now dealing with this. We don't want to spend a lot of no, time. No, that's, that's fine. I, that's why I made the suggestion. That I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, just a quick question for you. Could you do the motion to allow for a day to draft a report just like we did with the previous? Certainly. Thank you. And this one will be for Greg's signature this time. We have a motion. We need a second. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those signify second aye. Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. I appreciate it being done right. Uh, no, that's that's fine. That's why uh, I didn't think there was need for new testimony on on this part of it at this point. If Mr. Fifeley doesn't have anything more to add. Okay. Um, David, anything oh, more? Could, I, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Uh, Mr. Harrison wanted to add some some comment. Okay. If there, if this is new information, it is. We'll it's new. Yep. Um, we'll we'll give we'll give you four minutes. Scott Harrison, Scott Harrison, Sioux Falls. Um, first, I just want to say that, because it has to do a lot with what I'm going to present here. I've been in uh, the graphic design business for over 20 years. I've designed political mailings, direct mailings, um, anything you can think of. Uh, the purpose of direct mail, of course, is to sell a product. So, I know a lot about the language. And the funny part about it is, all of my experiences I've had with clients over the past 20 years, whether they were really good experiences or really bad experiences, I have never forgotten. Anyway, besides the content of this, and I could go on for hours about how it's, these two PowerPoints are completely different. Um, the content isn't really the issue here. The issue is the timing. It was shown the last time we were here, and it was shown today, that this meeting was purposely moved. You're right. You're 100% right. Jeff said it, that the, the mayor must conduct his state of the city address. He must do that. He has to do that. He has to do it at a city council meeting. That's right. It's the timing of the meeting. It was purposely moved before the election so we could use it as a campaign. There was props brought into the meeting. I, I have a question yeah. at that point. You said it was purposely moved. You it had never that? been done that way before. In the three years that Heather, the three years that Heather did his state of the city addresses, it was always after April 9th. And so all of a sudden, 
the year that he's up for re-election. But uh, he I understand, I understand <laughs> that. But do you have evidence? Do you know his schedule? Do you know all the other ramifications that go with putting together this address? I mean, how do you, you're making a statement yeah. that I, I, I just failed to, I failed to comprehend. I've been on this Well, I, it would be nice if the mayor was here to answer those questions. Well, I think that's been answered. <laughs> um, well, I anyway, I'm just saying it has to do with the timing. Uh, I, I, I have no idea why all of a sudden, you know, you just, I don't know why he decided to do it, but it's pretty obvious that it was moved. It was moved for some reason. And I'm just saying, uh, moving the meaning, I mean, <laughs> Beat your head against the wall. I mean, it's pretty obvious why it's moved. So we have discussed uh, the timing yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Other, other items that are new. That's, I, that's all I have with that. And I also would like to say that uh, as someone who believes very, very strongly in my First Amendment rights, to be accused of harassment or of someone harassing when we're giving grievances to elected officials, that's a constitutional right. That's not harassment. Comments or motions by the board. Oh, I'm sorry. I would like to uh, potentially address a little bit of the, of the timing issue as well. Uh, not to take away from the work that the mayor obviously puts into this speech, but I started working for the city of Sioux Falls on February 25th, 2013. So I had worked for the city about eight weeks, I think, before uh, the mayor gave his. 2013 City of the City address that was, and there was a nice storm in there, so it took a little longer uh, to put that presentation together uh, last year. This year, we've all, me included, have all done this one time before, and it was just easier to get it done earlier. Mayor Munson did always provide his the last week in March, and uh, Again, not to take away from the work the mayor puts into it or the finance department puts into it, but my new position with the city of Sioux Falls makes things like this easier and faster, especially the second year around. So I just want to clarify that. Okay. Comments or thoughts from the board members? I'd like to say something. <clears throat> back again and I've just been listening to this very impartially and the thing that bothers me about this whole thing is that an individual can't come in good faith before the ethics board and state their case without being suggested of harassment and frivolousness. That really bothers me whether it's Mr. Danielson or any other citizen in this town, whatever they're coming in front of you for, you have the city attorney get up and suggest that to you and you all pounce on it and add that to this a dismissal. I suggest that you review your dismissal. And if you want to dismiss it, fine. But it should not be dismissed with harassment or frivolousness. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the public? Board members? Questions? We need a motion to deal with uh, item 14C. Okay, I'll make a motion to deal in terms of ethical issues. 
and that we dismiss as frivolous and with bias. So Jeff, do you want to state your motion? Yeah, uh, I just missed the last couple of words, frivolous and what? And with bias. With bias. Seconded. All those in favor signify saying aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Um, we have a motion to ask uh, Dave Feifel's office to prepare that report for my signature. So Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion is carried as, as presented. Um, there any other business that we need to take care of? I don't want to take a motion for adjournment. Second. Motion to the second for adjournment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.